what I want to talk to you about today. We're going to look at the book of Mark chapter 4, and I want to read to you. Uh, We're going to look at verses 35 to 41, because there's a story here, and it's not just a story. this This actually happened, but it's recorded in the Word of God, because it's something that God wants us to understand about a promise that has been given when you face difficult situations. Back in school, um, I, I was never a good test taker. Now, the reason I wasn't a good test taker wasn't because I, I couldn't take tests or I had some issue. It, here, here's what it was. I didn't want to prepare for the test. I didn't want to study. I didn't want to take the test. But, but with a test, I knew the test was coming. So I had time to prepare. I had time to plan. But here's the thing I didn't have time for. I didn't have time for pop quizzes. You see, in school, a pop quiz was a surprise, wasn't it? A pop quiz was an unexpected interruption in your life, and the purpose of the pop quiz was to test you to see if you knew the information that the teacher was teaching. You see, we're going to go through trials right now, and we're going through difficult situations, but God is still in control. Amen? Go ahead in your home. Say amen to that. That's a good good place to do it. But like a good teacher... God only gives us pop quizzes on that which he's already covered. Let me take a moment and say this. I want to talk to you today about what God has to say. And it has to do with overcoming fear, knowing that God has given us a promise. But here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying today that if you're scared or fearful or worried that you're by no means a Christian. No, you are. I'm not saying that if you've ever worried or struggled that somehow your relationship's in jeopardy. Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when trials come up in life and fear raises its ugly head, what are you going to lean into? Are you going to lean into the world or are you going to lean into your Savior? Because we've got to understand this. And if you're following along, if you did happen to print off one of the uh, outlines, this is in there. It's an important point. God, here it is, God doesn't test you on things that he has not taught you. God does not test you on things that he has not taught you. This, this spoke to me specifically because I've been asking the Lord in my life just for vision and direction, and uh, here's what the Lord spoke to me uh, months ago, and it was this, uh, my, my personal vision, if you will, and it's this, to help people become spiritually mature in their walk with Christ so that they may develop deep roots. We need deep roots right now, don't we? And become stronger and stand firm in our faith no matter what life throws our way. Because I'll tell you today, life is throwing things our way that are causing us to be concerned, it's causing us to worry, and it's attempting to consume us so that we'll focus on the worry rather than the word. Now again, please hear my heart. I am not, I repeat, I am not saying that God causes difficulties in life that we're going through. But what I'm saying is is that when difficulties do happen, His word says, by the way, it will happen. Remember, he says, in this world, you'll have tribulations, but God has overcome the world. Here's the question when you face difficult times like today. Do I know the information? And am I applying it to my life? You see, many of us might be tempted to audit the class. Have you ever audited a class? When you audit a class, Um, it means you don't have to take the test, you don't have to do the homework, you can just gather the information. And we may be tempted in times like this to just want to audit the Christian life. We don't want it for credit because to audit means we don't have to go through the test. Uh, We don't have to take the quizzes or do the assignments. Here's the problem, though, with our walk with Christ. No auditors allowed. You see, what we're going through right now and the, the, the tests that we're facing, these are all for credit because God is seeking to pass us on to the next level of spiritual maturity. God will use these moments to develop our faith. You know, we've had some unexpected things come into our lives over the last two weeks, and it's tested our faith in God. But the goal is this, not just only to test our faith, but to deepen our commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, though we're facing some difficult things right now, not only will we be strengthened by God while we go through these difficult times, but God's going to develop you and he's going to develop me to move forward in life. And as he develops us and we move forward, we're going to grow. We're going to become better because here's the thing about trials. Trials, difficulties, uh, these seasons where it seems that God is silent, 
They have the ability to throw you on your face, don't they? And to seek the Lord. They have the ability also to trip you up. Uh, They can come at the worst of times, but it's at these times, these moments, church, that the character of God shines through and develops us and takes us to another level. I want you to look at the book of Mark chapter 4 with me. And I'm going to look at just verses 34, uh, 35 to 37 right now that says this. You can read along with me as you'll see it on your screen or you'll see it in your outlines there. And it says, On that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took, along with, uh, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Let me pause just there a moment and say this. Jesus had been teaching the disciples. Jesus had been on the seashore, and he had just been in, uh, teaching them. They'd been in the classroom, and he said to them this. He said, let us go over to the other side. He gave them a promise. He said, let us go over to the other side. You see, everything was fine when they were on the shore, but now they're in the middle of the sea. And maybe for you and me, maybe everything was fine when we were in church a couple weeks ago, but now we're in the middle of our work week and and, and there's a fierce gale of wind that has stirred up. Maybe you were at home and you felt safe at home, but then all of a sudden you're face to face with difficulties in life. There arises a fierce wind. There's a Greek word for this fierce wind. And I did not put the Greek word in your outlines, but here's what the Greek word means. The Greek word for this kind of an onslaught of wind was called a lilac. It was a lilac kind of storm. The disciples were experiencing a lilac type of storm that was roaring and the boat was shaking, water was coming on board. And you and I have all seen storms in life, right? We've seen storms that that were bad but maybe didn't have much wind to it. But then there were storms that all of a sudden, it just out of nowhere, the wind came. All of a sudden, a lilac situation Here's what Jesus last told them when they faced their storm. He said to them this, let us go over to the other side. But as the boat began to fill up with water, they got scared. As the boat began to fill up with water and it started rocking, remember these are experienced fishermen. They understand what it means to, to, to face storms in life, but this was a lilac type of a storm. And here was their response, these seasoned fishermen disciples of Jesus Christ. In verse 38, it says that Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Church, we're in a, as we've said already, a a pandemic type of lilac storm in our world today. The coronavirus has sprung up and people become almost afraid to even want to talk about it. Or it's the complete opposite. We can't stop talking about it. And it's a storm that sometimes we feel that that storm is getting in the boat of our life. We're in a situation and the waves are splashing across the world and it's left us wondering this. Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? See, the disciples were in this storm, but where was their Savior? Their Savior was asleep on the boat. And it can cause you to ask some questions like this. Well, what good is the Savior who's asleep on the boat? Or we may say, what, what good is God if he's napping during the storms of our life? Because this was a, a, a deep sleep, by the way. It says that he was seriously sleeping. And how do we know that? Because it says that Jesus pulled out a pillow and went to sleep. You know, I don't, I don't travel very much. I, I, I do travel. I, I, I prefer staying at home as much as I can. But when I'm on a plane and I have to travel somewhere and I'm tired, sometimes I'll get a nap. And when I get a nap, I'll just lean my head to one side or, or maybe I'll lean my head to the other side. But if the flight's going to be longer than two or three hours and I'm tired and I want some sleep, I'm talking I want to be intentional about getting some rest, you know what I'll do? I'll ask the stewardess for a pillow because I have every intention of trying to get some rest. You know, I would have thought that on the boat, the storm would have woke Jesus up. I would have thought that he would have been very aware, but it says that the disciples had to go and wake him up. And when they do, they pose a question to Jesus that's on all of our minds in all of our hearts right now with what's going on in this world. And it's this, Jesus, don't you care? 
Jesus, don't you see that we're perishing? Can I say something to that, by the way, when you have those questions? Sometimes we feel guilty for having those questions, but when you're in trouble and it seems like Jesus is asleep. By the way, Jesus never sleeps nor slumbers. He's very aware. He's in control. But when it seems like, it appears like Jesus is asleep, the natural question for you and for me is to say, Jesus, don't you care? When you're in trouble and heaven appears silent, one of the first things we can do is wonder, does does God know what's going on? Why does it seem like that? Why, Why do we do that? Well, it's because in these moments in life, we wonder and we question, God, where are you in the midst of this? Why do we do that? Can I give you the, the, the most simplest answer that I see? When I read the Word of God and I see the disciples were so distraught over the storm, though they had a Savior in the boat, why is it that we're so concerned about what's going on with the coronavirus and the fear and the panic that sets in? Why is it that we're so uh, letting that overwhelm us? Can, can I just pose this question that, or this thought to you that maybe it's because we're giving our attention to the storm rather than we are the Savior? We're giving more attention to that. Now, having said that, I am not saying that with what's going on with the virus that's sweeping across this world is not real. It is real. We've got to be able to understand, and and, and my prayer is this, and we're going to pray for them at the end of service. I'm praying for every doctor, every nurse, every biologist, every chemist, every scientist that has the knowledge God gave them to be able to have wisdom from above to be able to know how to combat this. But for you and I, as we walk through this and we start questioning, sometimes it's because we've put our eyes on the storm more than we have our Savior. And we can do something about that today. You see, for those disciples in that moment, in that lilac type of a storm, the lilac storm became their focus. How do we know that? Well, because it took over their attention. Their experience didn't match what God said. God spoke to them, remember, and said what? He said, let us go over to the other side. But when they saw the storm, that's all they could see. Jesus said, let us go, but they were feeling like they were getting ready to drown, and there's a contradiction here. How can God be so good and things be so bad? How can God be a God of love when I'm facing a situation I don't know how to deal with? How can God care and let me go through this? Have you asked yourself, some of those questions maybe this week. You see, their experience didn't match the Word of God. Remember, God said, let us go. But the disciples said, don't you care? There's a contradiction there. We talked last week, church, about the spirit of fear, how it's going to try to come up and, and overtake us. Can I, say, can, I, can I just take a, a moment and say something to that? We addressed it. We prayed about it. And we spoke to that spirit of fear and said, spirit of fear, be gone in the name of Jesus. But can I encourage you in this? Just because you told the spirit of fear to go once doesn't mean it's not going to try to come back again. There's times I've told my kids to go do something. I've had to tell them more than once. How about you? Well, when it comes to the spirit of fear and we've addressed it, I want to encourage you in your home. I want to encourage you in your car. I don't care where you're at. This is the perfect time for the world and for you and for me to understand this. The church has less to do with the building and has more to do with the people. We are the church. Amen, church? However, we need to do that. But I want you to know this, that you can speak to that spirit of fear. There's a spirit of fear that comes. Panic comes as a result of that. But as I said earlier, I feel there's a spirit of criticism. But God gave us a promise. The Bible's full of the promises of God. And we need to remind ourselves of what those promises are. When you become afraid, remember, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When you panic, when you worry, let me give you this promise. It's not in your outline, but you can write it down. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 6 through 7 says this. Be anxious for, do you remember the word? Nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, Here's here's another zinger. With thanksgiving, church, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that what we all want? We want the peace of God. All of us want to know, Lord, are we safe? Lord, is everything okay? And he says, absolutely. He says, worry about nothing, but in everything else, make your requests known to me. 
Let the peace of God come in your life. And when it comes to criticism, remember James chapter 5, verse 9. Write that one down. Because he says to us, don't grumble against one another. In other words, don't, don't fall prey to criticism. Don't criticize our leaders right now. I don't care what party they're a part of. Right now, we are all the children of God. And we have to understand, God is in control. Submit, respect, honor that authority. Pray for them so that God can give them wisdom. You see, let me take it back to the Word of God. The disciples, they allowed their circumstances to control their emotions. And then their emotions controlled their theology, the way they think. The lilac storm made them afraid, and their feelings of fear now determined what they were going to do, how they were going to do it, what they would think. And, and it was at that moment that their belief said this. Their belief said, Jesus, don't you care? But Jesus responded to that. And he said this. I'm going to take it back to Mark chapter 4. Look at verse 39 and 40. It says that when they woke up Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? It says he got up and he rebuked the wind and the sea and said, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And then Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? And why is it that you have no faith? Now, let me clarify one more time. I want to make sure you're hearing my heart. I'm not saying that if you're afraid, you're not saved. I've been afraid plenty of times in my life. What Jesus is saying to them when he challenges them in this is he's saying, when you're afraid, are you going to lean into me? When you find yourself fearful, are you going to cry out to the very Spirit of God? Let me say something about the disciples that they did absolutely right. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. They found themselves in the middle of a storm. Here's the one thing they did absolutely right. They woke up Jesus. When you're in a storm, the very thing you want to do is wake up Jesus. Oh, does that mean Jesus was sleeping? No, Jesus is not. What that means is this. When you're going through your storm, Jesus is very aware. Jesus is ever-present. Jesus is more attentive right now than ever before because of the way that this fear and this pandemic situation is affecting our world. What he wants to know is, is when the storm shows up, do you lean into him or do you lean into your storm? I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I've learned uh, not to wait around, but to be quick to run to the Lord. When I was young, I thought I knew it all, <laughs> right? Uh, we all do when we were younger. But the older I get, the more I realize I don't know, and I don't have all the answers, and I don't have problems saying I don't understand. I don't have problems saying I don't have the answer, but I do know the one who has the answer, and I do know the one who does understand. Here's a great verse that I love. Write this one down for me. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, okay? Uh, whatever translation you want to do, it's powerful, and it says this. Probably remember this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous, do you remember the rest? It says the righteous run to it, and they are safe. We all want to be safe right now, don't we? And that's, that's what the spirit of fear tries to do, is rob you of your sense of safety. But your sense of safety and security is not found in this world. It's not found in the things that you do. It's not found in the identity of your job. And it's not found anywhere but in the very presence of God. That's why he says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, they don't, they don't crawl, they don't skip, they don't do the curly shuffle. They don't moonwalk to it. You know what they do? They run into the presence of God and they are safe. And we know that this is the right thing to do, to run into his presence, because when they sought Jesus in the midst of their storm, Jesus did something about it. It says that Jesus, when, he, when, when they came to him, he got up and he spoke to the storm and he calmed it. I want you to know we serve a Savior that can speak to, to any storm we face. we got a Savior who can speak to the coronavirus and say, stop, be gone in the name of Jesus, and it's a done thing. But church, even if God doesn't do it that way, it doesn't mean that he's not in control. He still is. And we have to lean into him. Uh, notice this in verse 38. In verse 30, 38, it says that they called him something. Do you see this? It says they called him teacher. They called him teacher, and the job of a teacher is to communicate truthful information so that you can learn. Jesus had been teaching them on the shore. They were on the, on the, on the side of the sea there, and it says that Jesus had been, had been 
teaching them and communicating to them truthful information. And um, uh, he now wants to go over to the other side. So he looks at them and he says this, verse 35. We've said it plenty of times, but I want you to massage this into your spirit. He said this, let us go over to the other side. You're in your homes and you're listening. Say it with me. You ready? Here we go. Let us go over to the other side. That's the promise that he gave to them. And it's the promise that he gives to you today in light of all that's going on. We're going somewhere, church. Now, I know right now it doesn't look like it. I know right now it doesn't feel like it. It feels like the water's coming in the boat. It feels like the waves are crashing in on us. It feels like we have no control over what is going on. But Jesus knows what's going on. And Jesus is in control. And he speaks to us today and he says this, let us go over to the other side, church. I believe with all of my heart right now that Jesus is taking us, the Lord is leading us into a new season. I believe we're headed for a place of a potential revival in our land that we maybe have never seen before. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how it's going to play out. But chances are, if I knew and the Lord let me in on that, I might screw up his plans. So what do I have to do? What do you have to do? Trust the Lord. I believe we're in a season that it seems like things are going crazy, but God is absolutely... Now, again, please hear my heart. I'm not saying God orchestrated any of these situations we're going through in order to bring about a revival. I believe this. Life happens. And in the middle of life happening, God shows up and reveals himself. Let's not forget what the teacher says to us. He gives us plenty of promises in the word of God. For example, in this world, you will face tribulations, but be of good cheer. Why? Because he said, I have overcome the world. We're going to a new place, church. We're going into a new season, and we're going to make it to the other side. Did you hear me? We're going to make it to the other side. Therefore, you and I need to grab our pillow and find ourselves in the same place where our Savior is. The question is going to be this. It's in your outlines if you want to fill this out. When your circumstances, here it is, when your circumstances contradict God's word, what are you going to believe? That's the question. We have to remember this. When storms show up in our life, God is completely aware of what's going on. When your circumstances, though, say one thing and God says another, who are you going to, who, who are you going to lean into? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe your circumstances or are you going to believe your Savior? The choice is always going to be ours. And when we're going through these difficult times, what the teacher wants to know is this. It's in your outlines. Here's what the teacher wants to know. Do you trust me? That's all he wants to know. You know, my son, when he was, he was growing up and really young, one of the things that, that we have between us is, do you trust me? Since he was a little boy and had to go to the dentist or to the doctor and fear would come in. And, and I knew it's a procedure he needed. He didn't want it. I didn't want it for him, but it, it, but it needed to be done. We had to go through that in order for there to be health and healing so that growth could take place in a natural way. And I would tell him, Seth, do you trust me? Ultimately, after about 20 minutes, <laughs> he would say, yeah, Dad, I trust you. And we would go through it together. Church, your Savior is here today, and he's saying, Church, do you trust me? Because if you trust me, though maybe for 20 minutes we have to work through in our own hearts how we're going to own that and how we're going to trust him, I guarantee you God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is on the throne. Remind yourselves of that every day. Because what the teacher wants to know now from, from us is this. Do you trust me? You know, here's what the disciples could have done, maybe should have done, but didn't do. And I'm not going to throw rocks at them because... I, I probably wouldn't have done this either, but here's what the disciples could have done. They, they could have said this, you know what? Things look bad and the storm is kicking up and I don't know what to do. However, teacher said, we're going to the other side. So therefore, I'm going to rest. As a matter of fact, the teacher is so confident that we're going to get through this storm that I'm going to pull out my pillow and I'm going to find myself where the teacher is. Can I encourage you today, church? Jesus is in control. Find yourself where he is at. Jesus is in the Bible, it says this, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Now, that's good news for you and for me, because as man, he can feel what you feel. He feels every worry and concern, every moment of panic. He understands that. He can feel what you feel, but as God, he can do something about what it is that we feel. 
God promised the disciples a guaranteed arrival. Jesus was with them. They had seen his power and they had heard his word. And they learned something that we must learn. In your outlines, write this down. Jesus can be trusted in the storms of life. In, in fact, can I tell you this? You won't know how much you can trust him until you're in a storm. You never know how much you need God until God's all you have at times, right? Well, we're in a situation where he's calling us to lean into him. You and I won't discover that until we're in storm situations, lilac storm type of situations. And here's what the, the disciples discovered. When they woke up Jesus and Jesus spoke to the storm and the storm silenced, it says in verse 41, that the disciples became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, they thought their storm was powerful, but when Jesus spoke and that powerful storm silenced, it says that they became afraid of him. Now, let me explain that. It doesn't mean they were scared of Jesus. The word afraid means this. They were in awe of him. They, were, they had complete respect for the authority and the power that he had, that the storm that seemed so strong silenced at the voice of their Savior. Can I tell you something today? The storm you're going through today, whether it be a coronavirus type of storm or a spirit of fear or maybe criticism, when Jesus speaks, those voices have to silence like that because he is all-powerful. They thought their storm was powerful, but they learned very quickly that their Savior was even more powerful. Verse 41 says, when they saw what Jesus could do, and when they saw that the wind and the wave obeyed Jesus, they were in awe. You see, their circumstances caused them to fear the storm more than the one who could speak to it and tell it to be quiet. Before this whole scare, think of even the uh, trials you went through a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. Now, you can couple that with what we're going through today. Look at the attention that we give to trials. Look at the attention that we give to difficult situations. We think about it all day. We talk about it all day. We fuss about it all day. We complain about it all day. We can't sleep at night because of it, because the storm inside of our life is shaking us up. Church, if that's where we're at, we've got the wrong thing shaking us up, because here the disciples, they, they, they understood who Jesus was. And when they understood the power of their Savior, it says they recalibrated their heart. And I believe that's what he wants us to do today, is to recalibrate our heart and not focus on the storm, but to focus on the Savior. That's when panic leaves, and you can pull out your pillow and rest in the presence of God. You see, when they first woke Jesus, they said this, Jesus, don't you see the storm? But when they found out the power of Jesus, it says that they stood in his presence, and they were in awe. There's a little bullet in your outlines. You can fill this in. It says, you always fear most that which is greater. Uh, think of it this way. Take it back to the schoolyard, the bully who always steals your lunch. When the bully's three foot two, weighing in at a total of 60 pounds, and he says, I'm going to take your lunch money, you don't get very scared. But when that same second grader is six foot two, weighing in at 220 pounds, with biceps 21 inches, now you become more afraid because you fear that which is greater. The enemy in this world want you to fear what you're hearing all day long. But can I tell you something? There's something much greater than what you're hearing on the news. I'm not bashing news. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not here to preach on that. I'm not saying that advice you get from others is bad. We're not talking about that. I want you to know there's something much greater to fear, awe, honor, respect. And it's our Savior who has the greatest words to speak to us. You see, if we, if we perceive or fear that our circumstances are greater than even the coronavirus, then we're always going to live life feeling like our boat is sinking. We're always going to be feeling like the waves are splashing in. But when you and I realize that we have on board a Savior, not only one who knows how to walk on water, but can speak to the storms and they obey, then we will move out of panic. And we will move to a place of resting in the presence of the Lord. You know, true story I heard of a boat trip that was going to Alaska. And the captain was heading down. And as he was facing the storm, he knew the storm was coming. They weren't there yet. He made a decision. There was a lilac type of a storm that was coming. And they knew that they were going into the storm. And they didn't tell anybody that they were going into the storm. They just went into it anyway. 
And as they were in the middle of the storm, people started noticing, hey, things have changed, the atmosphere, the environment. They became a little bit afraid, and, and one lady called the captain and said to the captain, Captain, are you sure everything's okay? Did you not see this coming? Do we need to worry at all? And the captain said, ma'am, this ship was built with these kind of storms in mind. This ship is seaworthy. Go back to sleep. The captain is at the wheel. Five hours later, they found themselves in smooth sailing water. Now, I don't know what specific storm you may be going through in your own personal life. We all know the storms that we're going through in our world and in our, in our nation. But I can tell you this, if Jesus is on the boat, then your boat has been built with these kind of storms in mind. You can rest because Jesus is at the wheel. God has not been taken surprised by this. We have. We've been, we've, we've, we've been surprised by this, but God has not been surprised. He knows exactly what is going on. You know, there was a story, and a little boy who was on a plane and was full of other people, and and they experienced the uh, turbulence. If you've ever flown and you've experienced turbulence, sometimes there's the normal turbulence you experience. But every once in a while, you may experience dramatic turbulence. One that kind of when you drop, it either tickles your stomach or makes you maybe want to get sick. I don't know. But it was that this, this particular ride was a violent one. The turbulence was bad and people were becoming afraid. They were becoming fearful. They were scared. But there was a little boy in the front seat and every time they'd hit the turbulence, he would giggle and he would laugh. He'd continue to play. As a matter of fact, the, the worse the turbulence got, the more people became afraid, the more the little boy laughed. And one particular older lady got upset with it. And finally, as the turbulence got bad and the people became afraid and the boy laughed, she finally looked at the little boy and said, stop it. Would you just stop it? Quit laughing so much. How can you be laughing and playing at a time like this? And the little boy looked at the lady and said, Lady, when your daddy's the pilot, you don't get all shook up. You see, when you don't know who's in the cockpit of your plane, you, you get all shook up, don't you? But when Jesus Christ is in control, even when there's turbulence like you've never seen before, you can trust him. You know, I, I was talking with Pastor Chris this week. By the way, church family, if, if you're watching and you've got children at home and you're wondering, what are we going to do with our kids in Sunday school? Go to our website, kotod.church. Look through there, and you're going to find we put Sunday school videos on there for you. We put on there projects so that you can do some things at home that will be Bible lessons that, with materials you can find in your very own home to teach them. Uh, Pastor Chris and Andrea have put together some instructions for you. Go check that out. But as I was talking with him, uh, he shared this verse. He said, you know what's a good verse, and here's what the kids are learning this week, and I want you as parents to know about this. Even if you're not parents, you need to know about this. It's Psalms chapter 46, verses 1 through 2a, and it says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Isn't that a good verse? Isn't that just one good to put in your heart? Let me read it to you again. God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. I don't know about you, but it seems like we all feel like this is a very present time of trouble. Therefore, anytime they put a therefore in the Bible, you got to look and see what it's there for. What's it there for? We will not fear. We are not to fear. I want to just take a few moments and close with this, church. Um, last week, I had the opportunity to do communion with a group here at the church. We were getting ready to, um, we were getting ready to do some ministry. We were wrapping our minds around what we need to do as a church. And as we prepared to take communion, uh, just a picture. Sometimes the Lord gives you pictures, and he does that with me. And, and I thought of a fireman. You know, firemen, whenever they go uh, to battle a fire, they never go without their gear, do they? It, it never happens. One of, one of my favorite movies that I like is Backdraft. It's a, it's a good movie, Kurt Russell in it. But you got to remember, this is Hollywood, right? So when Kurt Russell goes in Backdraft to fight a fire, he does it. And he walks with the coat, and he's got the, the, the good-looking helmet on and the, and the pants with an axe, and he kicks in the door, and he takes care. But I happen to wonder, where's his mask? Where's his oxygen? Where's the hose? You know, that's Hollywood. Hollywood says it's more important to look good. But when you look at real firemen, <laughs> real firemen, when they pull up to a fire, and there's a critical situation, we wonder sometimes why they don't run in. Hey, there's a fire. Don't you see the flames? Grab your water or grab your hose, get the water, and put out the fire. But here's what they're doing. 
They're rolling up to the situation and they're assessing the situation because they don't know what's in there. They're taking a look to see what kind of a battle they're blazing and then they gear up accordingly because they don't want to go in and fall through the floor. They don't want a ceiling to collapse upon them. They don't want explosives to be in there and all of a sudden take them by surprise. So they assess the situation and then here's what they do, church. They gear up. They gear up and they put on the helmet. They put on the mask. They put on the oxygen tank, the coat, the hat, and they grab the fire hose, the axe, the saw, whatever it is that's required to do the job. I believe we're in a season, church, that we do not need to fear. Please hear that. We do not need to fear. So what is it, pastor, that we need to do? Church, it's time to gear up. God is calling us to a new season, and he says, church, it's time to gear up. I put in your outline Ephesians chapter 6. My heart just went there as I thought about this. He's calling us to a time where you and I are to gear up. Here's what Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil days and have, all, and have all, done all to stand firm. Church, I firmly believe this. When we see something going on like we see today in the physical, visible realm, there's always something in the invisible spiritual realm that's going on that's much greater. There is something going on in the spiritual realm right now that is taking place that if all we do is look at what this world is going through, if all we do is look at the statistics of the coronavirus, if all we do is try to, to give in to fear and to panic, we're going to miss the greater thing. And that, there, that, that is that there is a spiritual, invisible battle that is going on. And God is calling you and me as um, ambassadors of Jesus Christ that are living in this world to gear up. It's time, and I put it in your outline, it's time to put on the belt of truth. It's time to put on the breastplate of righteousness to have the, number three, the feet of peace, to take up the shield of faith, to have the helmet of salvation, and to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's time for us to gear up, church. We are the most, we are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. This is not a time for us to run from the fire, but to run to it. But you cannot do that without, first of all, gearing up. This is a time to seek the Lord, and don't become afraid of the lilac storm. It didn't shock God. Don't let it shock you. It didn't concern or worry God. Don't let it worry you. Why? How can I not? Because Jesus has given you and I a promise, and it was this. Let us go over to the other side. And if he gave us that promise, God's word will be fulfilled. Church, we're going to get to the other side. But right now, it's time for us to gear up. And I want us to do this as we close. I want to pray for you. I want to do two things. If you're watching this on live stream, which most of us have to right now, and you're saying, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know if if, if I have, I don't know if I've made that decision. I don't know if I've asked Jesus, because you can't gear up with what God has to offer if you've not said yes to Jesus. If you don't have them in your heart and in your life, what happens is this. You'll hope and you'll wish, but you won't have the promises of God because the promises of God are given to those who are called his sons and his daughters. If you're watching today and you know that you've not asked Jesus into your heart, if you know right now that that you do not have that peace that God gives, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to walk you through that prayer because the word of God says this confess with your mouth and believe in your heart says that you're saved I want you even in your homes to just bow your heads with me and we're going to do this and then I'm going to pray for us as a church but if you're listening today and you've not made that decision for Jesus would you just say this prayer after me Jesus I'm asking you to come into my heart and to save me from my sin Lord I repent of my sin today And I ask you to come into my heart. Go ahead and say that to him. Jesus, you died for me. 
So I'm choosing to live for you. So Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart. I want to tell you today, if you've prayed that prayer, then you need to know absolutely, without a doubt, Jesus has come into your life, and you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. Now I want to pray for us as a church. As we go through this situation where we're facing difficulties and we become concerned, I want to pray that God will give you a sense of peace like you've never experienced before because we're in times that we've never seen before. Father, I pray today that you would come by your very spirit. And Lord, I pray for each and every person that is listening today by live stream. Lord, I pray for those that are going to be watching later that, Father God, as we go through this season, that we would be reminded that you have not given us a spirit of fear. You've not caused us to lean in to what the world has to say. You've told us to be wise about what's going on, but you've called us today to gear up and to put on that armor of God. Lord, I believe with all my heart you're leading, leading us into a new season and into a new situation of life. And Lord, it's going to look different. But even though things may look different, you never change. So, Lord, I speak to the spirit of fear, and I say to the spirit of fear, you must be gone in the name of Jesus. To the spirit of criticism that causes us to want to put others down and question our leaders. Lord, to that spirit of criticism, we say be gone in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, to that panic that tries to rise up, Lord, we say panic must be gone. And in its place, we put a pillow, a, a pillow of your peace, the peace that you give us, not as the world gives, but as you give, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we gear up this week and as we get engaged with what you're going to do, Father, we trust in your very presence to lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can I just say this to you, church family? I, I want to ask you to just check out the website. We're going to be communicating through the website very much. That's kotod.church. Just type that into your web browser and it's going to bring it right up. C-O-T-O-D. Church. If you're a Facebook person, you can go to Facebook, and we're going to be communicating there as well. We're going to be doing plenty of videos trying to show you, uh, again, how to connect with live stream, how you can find sermon notes. For those of you that want to give in your tithes and offerings, I know that, that we're going through difficult times, but it, when we honor the Lord and give, God blesses. And you, I've had plenty of people call just to ask, how do we do that? Uh, you'll find it, a video on Facebook as well as on the website, and it's a very easy way to to do it. But if you have questions, please feel free to call the church. Remember, we are family. If you're going through a difficult time this week, if you're facing times where maybe um, you, you just have a, a very practical, personal problem that, that, that you can't deal with and you need help, call us and we'll do what we can. We're praying for you, church. We love you. And I ask you to just be flexible. Uh, we must be fluid as the Holy Spirit leads us through these seasons because as we do, then we know that we're being led by his presence and not trying to control whatever it is that God wants to do. So church, I love you. I'm praying for you. God bless you. And we will see you next week.